Hello again, then. Welcome to the Future Food Meetup, co-hosted by Annex Food and ProVeg Incubator. We are talking about dairy alternatives uh, today, tonight, depending on where you are. And our guests are a couple of fantastic startup founders and one um, impact investor. We're going to present them or they're going to present them themselves in a, in a bit. Let's make a quick intro on um, ourselves. So, Fabio, how have you been at NX Food recently? <laughs> thank you very much, Alvaro. First of all, thank you for hosting this wonderful session here today in your beautiful uh, location here in Berlin Mitte. Uh, when we had the introduction, you just said this is a place of peace and I can really underline this. Um, yeah, the, um, the recent time at NX Food was, uh, I think, like for everybody, a quite unusual time uh, due to this COVID-19 times. And uh, I must say um, that uh, things have developed. Uh, you're getting used to work with uh, all the uh, digital tools that we have now in place. Of course, there are sometimes still these technical issues, but since the food business is a very emotional and a very personal business uh, it's always yeah great to have this uh, the, the social context still and uh, this is why i'm doing sometimes um, my trips to berlin and also to to other uh, cities because we are as annex food based in dusseldorf to meet all the people to to have an exchange of course there are almost on every evening now um, conferences uh, and 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 other roundtable sessions but um, it's really great to, to have the opportunity to meet people in person and then to, to discuss, uh, uh, discuss some things. Yeah, so um, about NX Food, um, we are as NX Food um, are now the innovation hub uh, of a German um, wholesaler, but are now more and more pivoting to a boutique strategy consultancy in the future food tech um, um, business. And this is uh, quite important to know because um, for us, the past years, it was always to bring startups and new solutions from a tech perspective into an operational perspective. So you remember when we had the vertical farming project with Infarm together and a lot of alternative protein um, projects in the past. And now we think it's time to also do it together with other partners in this ecosystem. So this is what we are now doing, and we are really happy to have partners like you, like ProVeg, which are doing an incredible work. And so it's for us, as our, as our participants here, also very important to know what ProVeg is doing. <laughs> Thanks, Fabio. Yes, um, it's been, we've been very, very busy during these, um, COVID-19 times, the new normal is now, we're doing most of our things um, online as, as everybody else is doing. We got used to those tools, to Zoom and so on. Um, so it's a good, it's good for a change to actually go to the office or to actually meet partners, to meet startups, to meet people in person, which is still very, very important. Um, but it's also good to see that things move on, that we can actually get a lot of things done and achieve a lot together using um, uh, remote platforms and virtual um, formats. So yeah, this is something we just all got used to. Um, and what was also very important is that when we when this whole thing started, I think many, many of us were scared that this was would especially hit startups in a very, very hard way. And now looking back, it's good to see that when it comes to investments, when it comes to funding, um, to product launches and expansion plans and so on, most of them did great. And um, actually for the plant-based space as well, for alternative proteins, for food tech, for biotech, this has been quite a good first half um, of the year with amazing numbers when it comes to fundraising to financing rounds so this is really exciting and we're happy to see to see that yeah before before we start with the official part of our uh, session today we was, want just to uh, say to you that this is an interactive session so please feel free to raise some questions over the tool over the chat function uh, and since we are tackling a lot of topics today not only the investment side and the ingredient side, the supply chain, supply side, uh, supply chain, supplies, <laughs> supply chain, um, security side. Um, these are topics we want to take. And of course, it's very important for us to get your questions and maybe some ideas that you want to bring on the table. Um, the second thing is um, 
this is uh, not only interactive via the Zoom session, so please, if you want to share some ideas also via um, the social media, um, um, yeah, uh, social media, uh, LinkedIn uh, and, and other platforms, then please feel free to use the hashtag future food tech talk or future food talk. I think future food talk is better, right? <laughs> or several, if you like. I mean, there's plenty of hashtags. We like future food, we like food tech and food tech talk. So use those that we also use and use those that you find appropriate, but it's all about future food and then definitely about the tech side of things. Great. Yeah. So one more thing on, on ProVage Incubator, we are working with um, early stage startups in the plant-based um, and cell-based and fermentation um, area. So these are the things that, uh, these are the startups that we that we um, support um, here in a, with a three month uh, program. It used to be on-site, off-site startups coming to Berlin and then working remotely from wherever they're based because it's very international. We have worked with startups from, from more than 20 countries now. Um, now it's all fully virtual and it's also working well. So it's been exciting to see this year that um, where it's going and that we had all these startups on board from India, from Australia, from even from Chile. Um, a couple of them are also um, in our panel tonight. And I think we can get started now with the first um, one. It's actually from, from here, from Berlin. We're going to um, bring Christian Krause, co-founder of Sweets, um, to the stage now, please. Christian? Hey, good to see you. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, hey, how's it going? Hey, can you give a give us a quick uh, introduction on what Sweets is doing? What's special about you and how you've been doing during the challenging times we've all been facing here? Yeah, of course, absolutely. So uh, together with uh, my co-founder, Vish, we, uh, we started uh, Sweets to tackle the consequences of uh, the uh, overconsumption of sugar and dairy. And we do this by offering consumers um, sugar-free and plant-based alternatives. And we're starting with our first range of uh, chilled mousse desserts uh, with the flavors uh, mousse chocolat, peanut butter mousse, cold brew coffee mousse, and a lemon cheesecake mousse. And that was fun. And um, so we recently graduated from this from the first virtual ProVich incubator program this uh, summer, and where we were pleased to win the best pitch award from the jury. And uh, this was actually going on uh, during the lockdown here in Germany and before. We, um, we start to supply our desserts to, to local gastronomy business to, to validate this channel and also uh, the consumer and partner feedback. And we grew up to 20 partners beginning of March and uh, with the lockdown, we were down to zero. So uh, we really focused on uh, things like uh, the, uh, running a, the successful incubator program with you guys. We uh, also got deeper and investigated um, uh, our current IP pathway. And uh, we also, very important, made our product um, uh, ready for retail and bigger food service partners. And this is where we stand now, uh, about to launch to the UK uh, and uh, in, German, um, in German food service and with the first uh, retail partners here. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thank you very much. Thank so you. as our next speaker, we uh, want to become Luke on the stage. Luke is the founder of Pink Albatross. So welcome, Luke. And Luke was um, part of the cohort before Christians here at the ProVich Incubator, which was a, an on-site um, program. So we had them here in Berlin with the other startups. Was yeah. Now, now it seems like a very, very long time ago, not even a year ago. And as it happens, those guys, Ping, um, Ping Albatross by Rethink Foods, Luke and um, and his co-founder Pepe, they also uh, won the award for the best um, pitch on that very special night on our demo day last year. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Perfect, okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Luke Saldana. I'm based out of Madrid. 
And together with Pepe, my co-founder, we founded a Pink Albatross and we make plant-based clean label ice creams. Um, we started selling into the market in June of last year. That's when we launched our first, our version one of our product. And we had quite a nice traction coming into this year. And then of course, uh, COVID hit all of us and that came, everything kind of came crashing down. But as in the case of Christian, it also, because our entire supply chain was interrupted, our co-manufacturer closed for two and a half months. Um, many of our food service customers closed as well. So our sales operations just kind of came to a standstill. And uh, believe it or not, the operational side of things takes up a lot of bandwidth. Um, and all of a sudden having all this free time, we said, what are we going to do? So we really looked at the business um, from many angles and we said, coming out of this, we're going to have to be more competitive on price. We're going to have a better crop product and we're going to have to find another way to scale um, if the winds blow in our favor. So we spent two, two and a half months um, reformulating the product entirely, uh, changing the ingredients, changing all the supplier, looking for a new co-packer, looking for the right type of machinery because we were operating in an artisanal facility and the constraints around an artisanal facility, as you probably know, are, are few to none. You can pretty much do anything in an artisanal facility except scale up. And when you scale up, there's things that you need to keep in mind in terms of how will the ingredients interact with each other differently because the process changes. And all that takes a lot of time and tweaking and fine tuning. So we dedicated those two and a half months to reformulating uh, the entire product, making it more competitive um, without sacrificing uh, our positioning of plant-based, of course, and clean label and the fact that it had to be great testing. Um, but I also, I also uh, agree with both the moderators. What we did miss out during this time was that person-to-person -person contact um, because the quality of the interactions, the quality of the collaboration is entirely different when you're engaging with people in person as opposed to online. And now we've managed to get some of that back because now we're a team of five as opposed to the original founding team of two. And now we're in a co-working space. Um, although we did have a little bit of a hiccup there because one of our colleagues, he tested positive for the virus, that means all of us had to test again. We had to get tested and the office had to be closed down and disinfected and all of that. So that created a bit of disruption, but I think it's just the sign of the times we live in. We just have to live with this uncertainty and these and these obstacles being thrown in your way. The, the, the customer validation uh, part that you just mentioned, if you are improving your product, etc., is something yeah. that's really important and that we will discuss also later on in, in our session because I think this is really critical for companies nowadays to bring this, comp uh, this, this product to the market, especially when you work in the B2B environment. Correct. Okay, thanks, Luke. Now we're going to welcome uh, to the panel Steve uh, Green, CEO of Yofix, based in Israel. Yofix is a dairy alternative, a company a bit more, yeah, a bit longer in the game already for a couple of years now. So we could say they're a uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a grown-up, but um, still startup um, mindset, I would say. So um, we will hear more from from Steve in a moment. Is there? Okay. So Steve, hello. Yeah, hi, hi. Nice meeting you, and uh, happy to be here here from Tel Aviv. Uh, so uh, we already existing for a couple of years, and already uh, uh, have launched our product uh, two years ago in Israel, and we're just launching uh, in the last couple of weeks in the UK. Um, I will share a couple of screens. So we started in, uh, in the kitchen, who is one of the leading incubators in the world, in Israel, uh, from the Strauss Group. And uh, we, we are a totally independent company already for uh, the last couple of years. So what we're doing is we are creating a new generation of wholesome dairy alternatives without the nasties. And like Luke was saying, uh, we are speaking about clean label products. Um, so all our products are uh, fermented, uh, so uh, the result is a probiotic uh, advantage benefit of our products. So the benefits, and we call it the holy grail, it's clean label, a probiotic, and also giving you the, the feeling of satiety, 
uh, because our product has gone is going through a zero waste production process. We've got our own uh, production process that was invented by our founder uh, Ronan Lavie. And what's important for us is that we are creating plant-based dairy alternative, but it's important for us not to have 30 ingredients in our product. So uh, 30 ingredients is fine, but when you don't uh, know 25 of them because they are all kinds of chemical ingredients, this is not what people are looking when they're looking for a healthy product. So we speak about having a short list of ingredients of only real ingredients. So that's a list of ingredients that we'll have in a yogurt alternative. So we basing ourselves on a blend of different ingredients, oats, lentils, sesame, and coconut, and we're not adding any additives to it. So our product is a totally stable product uh, without the need of any stabilizers or gums or anything else. So we're launching a, our new brand, The Real Foodist, uh, and the essence of the brand saying says it all, um, real food, uh, movement of real foodism, of uh, real ingredients that are all natural. So our first product is yorich. It's half a yogurt, half a porridge, and we're keeping uh, pieces of oats inside and we call it a breakfast spot with real food, fruit and oaty chunks. So this is the brand uh, that has been uh, started to be uh, sold in the UK. And uh, this year, 2021, uh, we hope we will be seeing, seeing the products in all the major chains in the UK. So we're here to revolutionize dairy alternative markets. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, this could be also the motto for today. <laughs> Great. So, um, as the next speaker, we have Max here from My Muesli. My Muesli, uh, it's a German brand which is quite known because they were the first ones who really brought the mass customization game into the food sector and were quite famous about it. Now they have also some other innovation in their portfolio, not only that they are doing personalized nutrition with a company that's called Lycon, they have also a brand, it's called Nilk. Uh, I find a very, very good name, uh, personally, Nilk <coughs> with an N, so for not milk. So please welcome Max. I hope you are already here in our call so that you can yes. take over. Perfect, thank you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for the short introduction. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, as, as Fabio just mentioned, uh, my name is Max. Um, I've been working uh, for, for my Muesli um, for three years now. Um, maybe maybe to give you some, some short background um, regarding milk, I, I'm just quickly sharing my, my screen if it's okay. Um, I hope you can you can see it now. Um, so basically, uh, what what I'm doing um, is is I'm um, uh, yeah uh, doing the innovations part at my muesli. So everything that is not the the, the standard business in terms of muesli and porridge, um, and that's basically based on my passion for for food and innovation that has been there basically from from the very beginning. And um, what we're doing with Nilk especially um, is um, to bring superb alternatives um, for dairy-free diet into the world. Um, so meaning we, we are here um, to do the same as probably all, all the others. And we want to revolutionize the dairy-free and uh, the dairy industry with a dairy-free um, and basically plant-based alternative. And um, basically um, why we are doing this, because we think um, the future has to be plant-based um, because um, the food industry is, is way too much um, high in, in emission production. So basically 31% of emissions are produced by the food industry. And uh, we want to, to be there and, and deliver a most lovable, sustainable and healthy product to the customer. And that's actually what we have been doing for the last years. Um, with, with our um, one liter milk or milk, so no milk really products. Um, and just recently, we, we also launched our um, small um, to-go milks and in three different flavors um, that you can get in the convenience um, shelves, basically. Um, and also for sure, um, with My Muesli, we have the opportunity to all sell this online and via the, the My Muesli stores. So it's uh, basically based on a, on a multi-channel um, yeah, sales uh, proposition. 
um, which is quite good for us um, to, to be very close to the customer um, and to basically develop products um, yeah, with them. Um, and that's uh, hopefully um, um, yeah, the, the track that, that helps us um, to revolutionize the, the dairy industry. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically in very short words um, uh, about me and uh, the way of, of milk um, that, we, that we have uh, gone so far. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Very, very exciting and uh, great to have you. So there's one more very um, interesting speaker on the panel tonight um, from the investment side. That's uh, Peter Dorfner from the impact investor Katjes Greenfood. He's uh, head of investments there. So welcome, Peter. And um, please also share a little bit more about your background, about what Katjes Greenfood is doing and what kind of um, investments you're doing in the dairy alternatives uh, space. So can you hear me? Yes. So um, as Katjes Greenfood, we are um, part of Katjes Group. Katjes, as you maybe know, um, is one of Europe's largest um, confectionery manufacturers with um, sweets brand all across the Western European countries. Most very known, however, they are for the core product, the vegetarian um, fruit gum, who are like pioneers in taking out the gelatin um, already over like 10 years ago. As Katia's Green Food, we are part of this group. Um, we are the corporate venture capital branch and we invest deliberately outside of the traditional um, confectionery market into young and growing plant-based food startups. Um, we usually we do CPG only, meaning the consumer packaged goods, so no food tech and no um, digital services or anything in the field that's really product and a brand focused investing approach. Um, we usually start investing late seed series A, which means for us like about 1 million um, in sales, either like retail or online. And we um, usually like invest up to 2 million per, per investment round. We are structured as like an evergreen fund. So it's like the family money of the Katia's group, which we are investing um, hence, we, we really want to have an impact with the money that we allocate to our portfolio companies and strongly support them on marketing, packaging, and branding. Um, particularly in the dairy alternative space, we have invested like in Fora, which is like a plant-based um, butter from the US, uh, like the first ones like to have like a palm-free, cholesterol-free alternative to margarine um, in the market, which comes as a um, serving size typical block and differentiates further like through um, a really high cooking point. So it's like really well suited for fine bakery, like making croissants by like melting later, making the particularly like fluffy and, and, and tasty. Like the, the other one, like who is like pursuing like dairy alternative in our portfolio is like the guns. The guns is like, one of it's an um, umbrella brand for various um, vegan products, but one of their signature products is like the cashew beard, um, which like the acquired cashew beard, I think was one of the first participants of the um, pro batch incubator of their first batch. It's now part of um, the guns, our portfolio company. It's like a really like a cashew based high quality um, yeah, cashew cheese. It's like the guns as of now was primarily like focusing on third party um, co-packing. And right now with Cashew Baird, actually they started their own production and become beyond the wholesale and become like a really producer manufacturer of plant-based products. So also like a new perspective for us. And last but not least and most important, and you already know him from before, like it's Pink Albatross. Um, um, the startup of Luke, um, the, the, um, who's like also on the discussion here today, which we like invested in this spring during the time he mentioned when we were like great structural changes um, in the company going on. As he said, like it, it's, it's from our perspective, it's the best plant based um, alternative to ice cream. There's like nothing as creamy as we saw it in the market. And hence, like we went in, in Europe outside of our like. Core market, the German-speaking region, invested into this 
Spanish um, startup and are happy to work with him together and help him like help them in developing their brand further and doing the international steps. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is, and you, you see it, uh, the audience, that we have also some inter interconnection here <laughs> between our panelists. The first question from, from my side is, since we are talking today about the alternative dairy sector, um, what is your expectation? And um, Luke, you already gave some insights during your um, time that you used also the time to develop some new products. But did overall, can, can you say that the, the whole crisis accelerated the market uh, as we ex are expecting it? Or is it more um, like that we see uh, um, yeah, some kind of difficult development because the B2B sector, the food service delivery sector is um, decreasing and so we have some difficulties here. Maybe you can, uh, each of you give us a short estimation how you see the current situation um, uh, uh, 2019 compare, compared to 2020 including your COVID-19 effect. Start with Luke, maybe, yes. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, I was just going to ask that. Um, so I think, so our, our perspective is the following. Um, there's no doubt that the retail sales of plant-based products have increased. And I think there's, the United States produces a lot of this data and there it's very clear. Plant-based meat alternatives have outgrown their the animal-based uh, meat products, and that has kind of continued uh, coming out of out, out of the confinement. Um, so that's definitely good news. I think we're seeing news that oat milk um, is growing the plant-based milk category. It's now displaced soya, and it's in the number two slot, right behind almond milk. Um, so that's also great news. Um, the sellout of these products is one thing. I think there's a positive trajectory there. But in order to get to sell out, you have to get listed, which means you need to convince the buyer that um, this is the right time for him to take the risk and to bet on you and your product and give it the required shelf space. And I think that's where things become a little tricky because the environment is conservative right now. Um, retailers are more focused on supply chain continuity. They're focused on security or hygiene practices in their stores, and they're just they're, they are they're focused on on making sure that they that that their best sellers continue to be best sellers. So, the appetite for risk, in our opinion or in my opinion, is a little low this year, and we see it in the retail channel, and we see it in the food service sector much more clearly. Um, for starters, many of the food service operators just have not opened coming out of the confinement. They're waiting and waiting to see what happens. And those that have opened, um, they're downgrading their, their, their offering, which means that they're reducing the number of um, dishes that they offer. And they're also reducing um, um, th their strategies are more around cost saving. So they're downgrading. They're not going premium. They're going the other direction. And they're looking for efficiencies. So it's not a conducive or a constructive environment for brands like ours that we're trying to break into the market. But there's, there's no doubt that the tailwind is still in place. Perhaps we'll just have to skip a year and the innovation, the pipeline will, will get released next year as opposed to this year. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how, what we're feeling. Thank you very much. So Max, what, uh, what is your expectation? Um, yeah, expectation or experience or experience uh, and expectation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, like uh, in in terms of experience, um, we we were pretty lucky that that the company um, was was already set up like perfectly in terms of distributed work and and tech setup and and stuff like that. So we were in terms of working environment not that um, yeah hardly impacted basically. So everybody could could continue to work in in, in terms of output and. And efficiency that that was perfectly fine because if you think about an enterprise that has more than 600 employees that's uh, i think a little bit different to to a small startup where you can react like a little bit faster so i think that that that's uh, what what yeah was a good situation for us um in terms of business um we saw that that the shift to online even increased so so our online sales kind of 
skyrocketed, whereas the um, frequencies in the in our stores, um, especially, but also in the in the retail sector, um, was was going down continuously, uh, e even harder in in our stores. Um, yeah, and and that's basically what what we expect for the future as well, because um, to to go into a store or, or into to re retail chain. Um, with your mask on and, and having um, kind of uh, hygiene rules is not that much fun anymore, probably for a lot of customers. So they um, are increasingly hiring online. Um, and that's also the case for us um, with Nilk, um, especially. Um, however, um, we, we see that, that in our case, um, the, uh, the, the retail chain is, is a must for us. Um, and and um, I would say that that Luke is perfectly right. Um, they are currently a little bit more um, cautious about about like pretty new innovations. If you look at the one liter segment, um, it's it's really really packed. Anyways, they're used to plant based milk alternatives, but if you look into the yogurt or, or to go um, segments, they are kind of um, yeah uh, taking a little bit more um, cautious step. Um, in that in that direction, um, asking a lot more questions, not open to to test that freely anymore. Um, so basically, um, we we have to think a lot about how we can um, make it more attractive to them. Because in our case, most of the products are ready or already, and we do not want to wait uh, another year to to launch them. Basically, can I ask you one question? You said the the, the online business skyrocket. Do you mean also for Nilk? So because this would be a very, very interesting perspective in, in a direct to consumer uh, context. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we are lucky that we have a product with, with muesli that is mostly consumed with, with milk. Um, and in our way, um, the, the founding idea of Nilk was that um, the plant-based uh, milk alternative market is growing. And that in some years there won't be any customers buying cow milk anymore. So the, the 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 thought was okay if they don't consume cow milk anymore they won't consume muesli. So um, we we had the idea of milk. Um, and uh, in that case, um, increasing sales in terms of muesli and um, for our customer segment is also connected to increasing sales of milk. Yeah. Thanks, Max. Steve, what was your experience last year and how did you make it this year? What's the difference? Yeah, I totally agree with what, uh, what uh, all the panelists said at this moment. For a startup company, um, getting to the retail at this moment, even if you're ticking all the boxes, plant base is growing. A clean label is growing. People are looking for more healthy products, more probiotic immune, immune system products. But at the other end, you've got the, uh, the retail who says, okay, uh, let's do more what we're doing at this moment and let's not uh, risk, let's maybe uh, postpone the launch in a couple of weeks. And for sure for startups, it's even important to, do, to show the traction. Uh, so... Uh, like Maximiliano was saying, is you need to just find a solution to de-risk it. So we postponed, we, obviously we, we are selling in Israel and online has been booming uh, through the retail, to the local retailers, so that's good. Uh, but we postponed our launch in the UK. Uh, it was meant to, to launch in March, but no one to speak with in March, everyone on furlough and everyone in uh, totally panic. So at this moment, we are uh, rolling uh, out our uh, launch, but obviously um, there's a lot of uh, surprises. Let's keep it in a, in a positive way. And uh, you need to really be agile to find a solution because in a product like uh, us or, or maybe also from Pink Albatross, uh, people need to taste the product. In-store tasting is making wonders. And at this moment, you cannot do tasting. So you need to find other solutions. So yes. It's uh, challenging, but we are there to succeed at the end. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned, of course, launches in, in different markets, even that that was something that, that became very difficult for, for many companies. And what about sales in Israel, in your home market during that time? What did you experience? Um, yeah, we, we launched a couple of new products. Uh, we are in the clean label uh, market. So we are the first clean label product in Israel. 
So also it's a, it's kind of an education of the consumers who is used to to drinking all kind of artificial ingredients and even with preservative inside. So yeah, it's uh, it's where we're looking at. We we've got our uh, our horizon, our vision, and that's what we're doing. So uh, yeah, we are we've got uh, uh, firm consumers. Uh, loyal consumers that are just waiting for the next product to come because they're believing in a more healthy and uh, clean label world. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, Christian, so um, you you just mentioned before we started this uh, official chat here that you're just uh, now in Munich because you produced uh, a, a new range of uh, products. Maybe you can give us an idea how the past months were for you and uh, how you see a potential to overcome the, like Luke mentioned it, uh, the conservative retailer to get your products into the shelves. Yeah, of course. So uh, as I uh, mentioned in my uh, introduction at the beginning of this year, we were like pretty much focused on uh, doing our own small batch manufacturing out of Berlin uh, to supply local gastronomy businesses to, valid to fully validate this market, to, uh, to get the data, the numbers for biggest food service partners. And um, then with the lockdown, uh, this channel came down to zero. And uh, we really used this time to uh, also to, to look into our supply chain to finally now, uh, uh, we finally decided to, uh, to, to use or to, to look for a co-manufacturing partner. And uh, yeah, uh, this week we, we produced the first batch with our uh, self-created process. And um, so in terms of, because we had to produce for the first orders, Uh, from from retail partners, from distributor partners, and uh, because what, what we uh, we were probably lucky with the retail that they now somehow got a little bit used to the situation because at the beginning of this year we also were in talks with like bigger German retailers like Globus or Real, and they fully had to put uh, the discussions on on ice uh, because of the concentration of their uh, current portfolio to. Um, uh, make sure that the supply chain uh, still works. And uh, now, especially when we're launching to the UK and with our main focus next to plant based of being sugar-free, uh, we really see that uh, there's also a change in consumer thinking. Um, plant based was already before one of the biggest consumer trends. Uh, but now uh, with the COVID, everyone was exposed to the news that being obese, having uh, or suffering from diabetes, no matter what age you are, this already puts you into a risk group. And uh, therefore, especially with the UK retailers, but also with the initial start of German retailers, um, this combination seems to work very well with them because they already know plant-based products sell very well. And, and now these guys are also bringing the sugar-free aspect in the game. So, uh, so far we got uh, quite positive feedback there. Yeah, a question that I also want to raise to the others and this is just an open qu uh, question. Now that we have no fares there, we have uh, bootstrapping is very difficult in the sector. How do you get access to all the uh, category managers? Because uh, I mean, they get at the moment they are over flooded with uh, with uh, requests for a listing, and uh, and I think it's very difficult to, to get now in touch with them and to to have this personal uh, uh, um, talks. And um, yeah, even if they are not so conservative. Sometimes it's uh, or it's it's now a bit difficult because they want to ensure that the business is running and yeah may, maybe you can give us an idea how you break through these walls. Maybe I can uh, I can start there directly. <laughs> so I still was uh, unmuted. Um, so uh, for us, two things worked very very well. Uh, first, introductions from uh, people in their organizations they have to listen to, and uh, also uh, pulls from existing uh, clients. For instance, we're uh, we're going to start supplying the Google offices in Germany, and they uh, 
They are managed by one of the biggest uh, food service companies in the world, it's called Eures or belonging to Compass Group. And uh, they are, uh, before they could just buy directly from you, but uh, with COVID, they were, they got the restriction. They, they are not only allowed to source uh, products uh, through Transgourmet, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, food service distributors in, in Germany. And uh, this is how we got uh, to this listing starting end of the month. Uh, and uh, it's super, like sounds super easy, uh, but just bombarding then them with LinkedIn messages. Okay, so the second part which you said with clients is uh, um, that you create use cases which you can uh, get access to, uh, especially in the B2B sector. So this is three learnings. Get to the management, uh, so find internal stakeholders. The second one, create use cases, how you can get access to, 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 to the retailers or the wholesalers by saying, hey, we have already contact to this client. And the third one was LinkedIn and being uh, being very, very uh, yeah consistent, let's say like this. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, the others, well, what are your advices to get to, uh, access to, 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 to the retail space? Uh, uh, thing is that for sure it's a, uh, it's uh, much more complicated than it was. Uh, if it's not complicated for a startup, so COVID uh, just uh, added some uh, some fun. Uh, but uh, as a startup, we were saying, if we're not getting through the door, you're getting through the window. And that's uh, how we're looking at the things. Uh, also, adapting yourself uh, to the changing habits. Uh, you speak about, Christian, you speak about the Google offices. Um, but uh, in a lot of areas, when we are planning to launch in the in long in London, uh, offices are empty. So we need to just change the uh, the way and, and getting more to uh, 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 sales in residential areas outside London, uh, uh, neighborhood stores and independent grocers. So that's uh, that's what we're go doing, uh, working agile with uh, field sales and. Uh, and, and starting to add uh, shop by shop. Uh, that's what uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, very, so you, if you want to break it down, changing consumer behavior means also changing your distribution channels. And if the people are staying at home, get in their convenience stores, get into their neighborhoods, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I can make a quick contribution there. We did two specific things um, that helped us gain the attention of uh, buyers. One was, um, and this is not so much for organized retail, but rather speciality stores. Um, we sent samples, just directly we contacted customers, retail, buy, small mom and pop retailers, surprisingly through Instagram, because people don't pick up the phone, they don't read emails, but they respond to messages on Instagram. So we contacted, um, I think, dozens and dozens of stores on Instagram. And for us, we were clear that we weren't going to hire salesmen. And for us, our product was going to be the salesman. So we invested in logistics and we invested in samples to get the product out there. So that I think that worked very well for the mom and pop uh, type retail establishments. And for the professional buyers, we did a social selling campaign. So what that means is um, we used LinkedIn as a platform to buy, to find professional buyers in the food service sector and in the retail sector and do an outreach to them, um, get them interested in our product, seed that awareness factor, and then follow up with information, follow up with, a, um, with an offer for samples. And we made some very interesting um, uh, contacts uh, and also new customers this way. At the end, we also found the same obstacles as before, irrespective of who you find, the person still faces the same constraint, but at least we made the connection. Very good to know. I think, Albrecht, the next session will be about LinkedIn <laughs> and uh, how you get uh, your, your customers or, or your partners via LinkedIn. I think it's really a very, very powerful tool. And if you use mm -hmm. it in the right way, then you can really get uh, access through. One last question before I end uh, over is uh, to you, uh, Max. Um, since we know that a lot of retailers are using you your, uh, or your brands also as a marketing tool to say, hey, we have now we are modern and we have a diverse uh, a shelf. 
how much is your big reach via Instagram helping you to get access to shells? Because I know that my muesli has a very, very powerful uh, uh, reach via Instagram and via social media. So maybe you can give us some indication how this uh, community and this reach can help you to get access and also to, uh, to, 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 yeah, maybe also leverage new target groups into the retail. Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually um, a good point. Like, we are pretty lucky to, to already have a really, really uh, big online customer base um, with which we regularly um, test our products. So basically, um, we, we go online first and, and basically test the market feedback there um, to um, exactly what Christian said. Um, um, yeah, yeah, work on, on, on our data set that we can present um, to distribution partners later on. Um, because if we have pro proven that already like uh, 10,000 customers bought the product and I don't know, 80% of them loved it and they, they re-bought or re-ordered, um, that's, that's basically a good um, yeah, uh, case for us to present to the retailers. And Especially with, with Milk, we are also lucky to, to have the access um, to the MyMuesli infrastructure in terms of their um, sales team, um, which is a, a daughter company um, of MyMuesli um, that, that takes us as Milk as, as a separate brand um, with them to the retailer. Or if it's another um, uh, yeah, person you have to talk to, at least they give us the, the right uh, person to talk to. Very good cross-selling effects here. Maybe Thanks. Yeah. One last comment here, like uh, sure. from my side. So um, more experience, like it's while you're not in retail, try to learn as much as you can about your category. So in the end, like retail is about the KPI productivity per space. There's like limited space in every shop. So learn about as like Max Mac said before me, learn about the category and try like to offer like a convince them with like compelling velocity plans and a solid margin to the retailer themselves. So like in the end, this is what they're looking for and this is what they're like listening, listening to. And uh, maybe you cannot work on the velocity, but you can for sure work on the retail margin, at least for the beginning and try to like get, get on the shelf. Like this is the most important thing for every food brand to achieve. And just one more point there, Peter, in support of what you just said, I also think it's good to segment the retailers because there are some retailers that are more open and less traditional and less classical in their approach and they're just much more open to the idea of working with startups and they understand the constraints so it's easier to get a foot into that type of a door than a more a client that has a more traditional approach to to retail i think it's that it goes to understanding like the customer that you're selling to and maybe as a, as a last small um, addition to that, um, because it's, it's perfectly um, underlining um, the point, um, we, we have some partners, especially from, from Edeka, which have like smaller markets and are more autonomous than their peers. Um, um, so they are um, yeah, more likely to test a new product um, coming in their own store um, compared to, to other large or larger Edeka partners or, or even Reva um, stores where you have to get a central listing at first. So it's always uh, very important to look at the structure of the retailing company. Um, and if you can find some more autonomous, um, smaller markets in which you can also um, get a proof of concept for your product. Thanks. I want to yeah, get go from category um, to look a little bit more at the market itself. This is goes for this is especially for sweets and for pink albatross, but I think it's for all the companies represented here. Um, it's about the desserts category. I remember that that Luke, um, yeah, that pink albatross mentioned this in their deck that it's actually a, a super huge category, but it's a bit overlooked by investors maybe as well. Peter can say something about it, but what about the, the desserts category by itself, the plant-based desserts? Um, how, how much potential is there from your, from, 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 uh, your perspective, um, from the company perspective and um, then from the investor perspective? Is this a question directed to me? Yeah, you can go oh, first because okay, you brought this up and it's true. You got the numbers, um, okay. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So if if I um if I recall correctly, I think um in Europe the entire um plant-based dessert space is around 18 billion 
of which ice cream is just 4 billion. So if, if my memory serves me right, so you can see the opportunity there. We're just focusing on one small segment, but reasonably sized segment of the entire desserts population. Um, and, and, and if you look at it this way, most desserts, if not like 95% of desserts have four components that are problematic for people, either from an allergen perspective or from a conviction perspective. It's uh, gluten in the form of flour, it's eggs, it's milk and it's cream. It's very difficult to make a good dessert without those four things. So the opportunity, as you can see, is clearly there, uh, but the task is not easy, right? Because those products, they add a, 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 functional, a, a, a functional dimension and they add a flavor dimension. So I think, yes, the opportunity is there, but finding a product that delivers the same experience, displacing those four ingredients, needs to be worked on. Uh, so I think the opportunity is, 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 is definitely there. Um, what, what, What's your take on this, um, Chris? Yeah, so when Bish and me started uh, to start this company, we started this out of the reason that we experienced the consequences uh, of sugar overconsumption with diabetes in both of our families. So we, we wanted to do something to reduce sugar. So this is why we really looked on which categories can reduce sugar because it was clearly from the beginning, just talking about it doesn't help because this uh, because sugar and especially in combination with dairy for desserts is super delicious. So uh, then we, 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 we scanned it and we said, okay, um, Luke is totally right. Like in, in, uh, in Spain, there was a super good gap for, for ice cream. But in Germany, we already had some well-established uh, players um, coming from the US, like Halo Top with like sugar reduced uh, uh, ice cream, but also plant-based ice cream. And uh, then we looked at the uh, chilled dessert shelf and we just uh, saw like the established uh, players, which is like not super well uh, developed products um, because usually you enjoy like a mousse au chocolat even made at home or uh, in, a, in a nice restaurant. But you're not, uh, the, the offerings in the, in the supermarket shelf is, uh, is not so compelling. And then we looked at existing plant-based desserts and you basically just have Oatly, uh, sorry, Alpro and uh, with their puddings. And we saw a, a super huge uh, opportunity to go in there and uh, to, to create uh, products that not only plant-based consumers love, but also helping um, um, omnivore consumers to transition to a more plant-based diet. And one thing to add, when we talk about plant-based, uh, we uh, already implement that it's dairy-free. But uh, just by uh, the geographic, we have uh, always dairy intolerant consumers. So uh, this is also a huge opportunity to cater their, their demand. Um, and um, Peter, how do you see the sector? Because uh, for you, uh, as Katya's Green Food, you are already doing with food steers uh, a lot in this sector. So uh, yeah, maybe you can give us also your indication. And after this, I have an additional question uh, uh, to you. So like, first of all, like I agree to like what um, Luke and Christian said, like before me, it's you can have a lot of impact with these products. I like can only from an environmental perspective by plant-based, like meaning the carbon reduction, as well as like in individual level, like like having like less artificial products, less um, sugared products, um, but like there's one more interesting aspect for investors and um, it's like that basically like it's not a commoditized category like butter and milk and um, they are like more or less it's hard to increase the per capita consumption of these um, type of products however like desserts like it's it, it's easier like to like get the same consumer like consuming more dessert um, the, than he did before as it would be like with milk compress. Like people only consume so and so much milk because like we will not like endlessly extend like um, using the consumption of milk. However, like um, with desserts, there's like strong potential um, to like increase like the consumption 
per individual consumer with the right marketing and, 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 and sales techniques. So like just from a commercial perspective, it's an interesting category. Of course, like, as you said before, um, Fabio, um, it's like often overlooked and uh, as an investing category, especially ice cream, because like, there's like very often only like a, um, a small time window, basically every year, they have like a chance to sell in and there's like one, one, hot, uh, one um, hot period in the year and it's the summer. And like for the summer month, like you have to be set up with the ice cream sales and then it's coming winter, it's getting cold and people are reducing consumption. However, like we, we think that um, the, the, if you do it right, if like approach the retail of the right value proposition, you can use this one time window to, to bring the product on shelf. So it's, it's really interesting. Also like from a food steers perspective, we are already seeing it like um, food steers for those who don't know it, or what Fabio mentioned before, it's like a baking mix brand from the United States, they're also like offering, but now like little um, um, sweet snacks, um, little baked sweet snacks, little donuts, and they're experiencing the same, like basically the cleanup products, better better for you products, especially in the in the treat yourself category are like um, getting strong traction because people still want to be indulged, but people also like feel a bit more guilty than before. Um, yeah, so, so my next question, uh, when we talked into all the others that competition, uh, competition is uh, getting bigger and bigger in, in each uh, sector now for new startups and, uh, and from, from uh, with a plant-based background, how do you see the game IP versus marketing or versus brand? So you have invested into Foodsters, you mentioned there's Sarah Michelle Geller, uh, one of the uh, uh, founders, so you have already a very strong brand or, uh, with a, a good community. We know that the Rainforest Company is working with Pamela Rife, so also, uh, um, I would say, an established brand. But um, how do you see it nowadays that this kind of products you are investing in, they must be already developed brands, otherwise it's very difficult to really go into the scale-up game, or is it really that you are looking for an IP-driven approach? You're absolutely right, Fabio. It's like getting more and more difficult for brands who are not having like some kind of base IP um, that like sets you apart from the competitors or like especially in early stages that like prevents um, runner-ups, even if you're number one, from taking over you with the right amount of funding. Still, we we strongly believe like as Katya Screen Food, like as an investor, you always must know where you come from and what your heritage is. Like in, with Katis, it's all about the brand. It's all about the sales. So we like we like top line driven investors. It's like our sweet spot um, where where we invest in um, helping these brands get on the shelf, perform on the shelf, and expand like to even more shelves, helping them to understand the categories from a sales perspective. So um, hence why we are like still focusing on these brands, and this is also the reason for us why we start like usually only investing like when these um, brands are like fully developed, fully established, have like a, a, a market ready product to start. But I agree that like having an IP is getting more and more interesting. And I also feel like that from a buyer's perspective, like those who buy these ventures in the end, like it's getting more and more asked, not only about the sales and the distribution, but also like what actually like did, uh, what's the technological background um, of, of these kind of products. So it's getting like more and more interesting especially when it comes to like a production running running behind um, the product, the own production. Talking the, uh, thank you very much, Peter. So talking about the IP, and this is a question that I really want to ask all the others. Uh, when we are looking at the meat sector, and especially the plant-based sector here, everybody is talking about genera uh, generation 1.0, because the next generation will be ultra-processed, will be cultivated. How do you see it in the dairy alternative sector? Will there be a biotech angle in your products uh, in the next couple of years? How do you want to further develop your product with a biotech uh, perspective? So talking about... Uh, the fermentation uh, side uh, and and ultra processing side and maybe also cultivating side. Yes, um, we're happy to to answer. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Okay, you. sorry. Um, yeah, we we are so we've got a, a, a proprietary production process uh, producing the products based on a fermentation process, a national fermentation process. And we see it as, as for sure an added value to the product because 
uh, going to a co-packer and just saying just makes me a little bit of oats and a little bit of uh, of uh, of um, uh, peanuts or something like this at the end uh, entry barrier is really really low uh, somebody is coming with another uh, uh, another recipe and then maybe a better branding and and you're dead so i think there's for sure a mix from one side having a great branding uh, from the other side having a, a really differentiating product because markets when you're looking at the map of all the uh, competitors it's just adding competitors every day and uh, it's it's really a struggle of the fittest because uh, in a couple of uh, months even years uh, half of them will be dead even more so uh, only the one that will have a differentiating product with a um, like you say a, a biotechnologist um, um, a special production process uh, will survive. That's that's how, how I see the things here. The others. Thank you very much, Steve. So from our side, um, even though we are believing heavily into the asset of a strong brand, we already uh, we are already having a IP pathway. So we are incorporating uh, technology into our manufacturing process. And uh, for the future, what we definitely have, uh, we're not sure yet uh, to uh, implement uh, biotech, uh, like precision fermentation into it. But what we definitely have on our agenda, like not now, not next year, but uh, not so far away, is to uh, bring uh, to bring a level of personalized nutrition into our products by by adding uh, trace minerals and um, uh, vitamins uh, that really is uh, customized on the demand of uh, in, uh, either demographics or geographics and uh, so to to convert a product from you can eat it to uh, it's better for you if you're eating it every day so uh, that's on the agenda uh, already. Uh, and uh, it's also uh, what we experience is uh, when you're like, when you want to defend yourself from big companies, you really have to, to use your advantages in, in supply chain. For instance, when you're talking about uh, biodegradable packaging, um, it, it's super heavy for a big corporate to include this into their uh, uh, supply chain because uh, it destroys all of their calculations but uh, for us as young companies we have uh, now the chance to to build it into uh, the communication uh, into the calculations and to communicate in the right way and therefore we are striving for uh, bringing uh, uh, converting our packaging completely to to a home biodegradable um, but this will be a huge, uh, huge task to achieve with a with a pot. You said uh, traceable minerals, and what was the other one? At uh, trace minerals, uh, for instance, like potassium to balance out uh, insulin resistance uh, and uh, vitamins um, like B12 or uh, other. And I think this is like the right approach doing it this way. Like in the end, like in the beginning, when you start your business or as soon as you have like some idea about what it should be, like it's a question, do I want to be like a B2C brand or maybe if I'm like in the cellular space, do I want to become like a B2B supplier in the end, like by licensing my technology. However, if you decided, as soon as you have decided to like hit the shelf with your product, with an own product, it's about time um, to get there, not to, like to raise millions before you actually like launch the product. Maybe even we could have done this um, or did this like because like they were really like the first ones in the space. But like try to get a good solid prototype, a good product that can hit the shelf with like a clear value proposition. And then as Christian did, as Pink Albert Foss is doing it, I think also Zofix is doing it like further refine it. But like, don't don't wait until like it's a it's a perfect IP behind it, a perfect product. Just get the consumer, bring it to the consumer, and, and also let them think about what you have done so far. It really helps, like also like in, even like in developing your IP further. Then uh, yeah, maybe, maybe let's 
let's talk about milk. We talked about the dessert category, but um, we haven't talked about milk alternatives as, a, as uh, the biggest category in the most developed uh, market segment, a billion dollar market now. Um, and I think yeah, Oatly made a very impressive uh, move um, just uh, very recently with their big investment round, including now, well, so to say, not um, not very plant-based um, um, investors on their side. And this is a change, I think, in the game. So, but speaking about the category from Peter's perspective, how interesting is it still to go into that space? There's new ingredients and that's, um, you know, there's only one more and one more again. And then you would say, what's the difference? But also from the startup perspective, the shelf is really crowded. Um, so how hard is it? And how do you differentiate from all the other players, starting with you, Max, maybe? since you just uh, you got your own milk brand yeah th milk. thanks um yeah m maybe connecting this to the to the question of brand versus ip um i, I think it it is a little bit connected to the to, to the category as you just mentioned because if you have a really saturated segment like the the ambient milk um shelf um you actually have to have uh, an uh, ip advantage compared to the other products i think just just going to the retailer and saying hey i have a cool looking brand, um, it's, it's not enough anymore because they have already um, by themselves jump on the train producing their private labor brands. Um, so they, they already know how, how, this, how this works. Um, so we, we are rather expanding into, into um, adjacent categories like the to-go segment um, in which we have like a milk drink um, for the on-the-go on the consumption, which is flavored, for example. Um, in which we see um, yeah, more, um, yeah, more potential to expand uh, into. Um, but maybe, maybe in the long term, as you mentioned, biotech, um, we, we think that, that it's super dependent on your um, customer segment that you're focusing. Because in our case, we are um, yeah, having a super natural 100% organic approach. And uh, from one day to the other with the same brand, um, switching that to super biotech approach um, might not work that well. Maybe, maybe a quick uh, looking back to our launch of the pea milk um, three years ago, which was back then the first in Europe. Um, that was basically not working that well um, as consumers didn't understand um, that the milk can be based on pea. So um, you, you have to educate the customers um, on, on, the same, on the same side. Um, because being at the forefront of everything is, is very good, but if the customer is not ready yet, uh, it could also be a big danger that you're facing. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, the funny thing is one, there was one dedicated question from our audience, especially to the, the pea protein source. Um, and this is also a question that I want to raise you to, to your old. Um, we have now, we talk now about oat, we talk about that there is a decreasing usage of soy, uh, that almond is uh, used. How do you see um, the whole topic of local protein sources? So, um, I mean, of course, uh, I've tested, uh, when was it, uh, last week, hemp. Hemp was uh, the, the product, it was uh, I wouldn't say disgusting, <laughs> but it was absolutely, uh, for me, in the, in the context of milk, it was really difficult. Um, but there are product, uh, so protein sources like nem lemna, duckweed. Uh, we have uh, the whole thing of uh, um, uh, lupina, yes. Uh, and, and, and also uh, in, in Germany, the Buchecker, yeah, this is also a very uh, new source. How do you see the integration of this new uh, protein uh, sources into into the, the, the product development. Um, what we what we have done for the last couple of years, I think we are screened uh, something like 100 different ingredients, and like you say, a part of them are totally disgusting to put in a product. So uh, uh, we are analyzing the different uh, advantages of every ingredient. If if it's adding proteins, if it's adding fibers. Uh, and we're trying to really get the best nutritional values out of it, not having just a product just to add uh, a texture. For instance, if you're adding coconut, you've got a couple of yogurts uh, with 20% fat in it. I don't think this is a, a healthy solution. So we're getting to a, a product with three, three, three and a half to 4% fat. And um, I think it's not looking at only one um, uh, hero, hero ingredients. At the end, 
every product can be adapted with different ingredients um, and uh, it's it's not only uh, it's not only about over exploiting uh, pea or hemp or uh, soy i think it's also about biodiversity and trying to get a, a blend of every product uh, trying to have ingredients with a good sustainability almond is not a, a great example out of it when you uh, need five liters of water to uh, to grow one almond and 80 percent are coming come from california when you see uh, fires in the uh, in the uh, um, fires all day long so there's a water shortage so it's important to get great uh, nutritional ingredients uh, obviously great tasting but also sustainable Uh, one more thing, please, to the audience. Feel free to to write your questions in the in the in Zoom to us, or use social media later on to reach out to our panelists to ask to Annex Food to Provage Incubator if you want to share something, if you want to ask something. So please feel free to jump in and join the discussion. So and uh, since uh, we we always trying to. Uh, to uh, you, uh, get all the questions that you're raising into our questions so that we have a uh, continuous flow. So um, the, there was another question about the climate uh, value uh, for, of, of the products. And this is something that you just mentioned, Steve, uh, and the connection with uh, the almond as, an, as a resource. Um, and uh, how do you want to use it uh, uh, overall in your brand communication the whole uh, climate uh, topic that that's uh, if it's climate neutral um, or if it's uh, if uh, or how the the ingredients are produced etc um, and 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 the whole topic of resources or res use of resources this is also something um, what what was your gut feeling how the 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 uh, um, uh, exception or the the attention is at the moment at the customer basis This is for everyone, but we still have Steve on the screen. So maybe you want to want to go for it first. Yeah, I think uh, in the plant-based world we've got a lot of claims, and uh, for sure it's important. There's a lot of importance about packaging, biodegradable packaging, or uh, um, uh, sustainable ingredients. You need to see that you need to 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 uh, to to see that the consumer are still buying your product, and there's there are things that are um, getting well past to the consumer, uh, but if in a lot of cases, also in my career in the food business, sometimes you're asking people what they want and they say, I want sustainability, I want packaging, and then they get into the shelf and then they see a promotion on another product and it's lower price and then they take in the other one. So you really need to balance well uh, your mix. For sure, sustainability is important, but you really need to uh, to see what is a, a point of a point of a, 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 a point that is selling your product. So it's part of your social media, part of your mix. But saying uh, on your packaging uh, with only sustainable ingredients, not sure that it will be selling from day one. Yeah, I also think from a brand identity perspective. The positioning of good for you, good for the planet is the most overused positioning for plant-based products. And I think just from a competitive perspective, I would not recommend it, but that doesn't mean that you can weave it into your operations, um, your communications in a secondary manner or through select channels like Instagram or your web or your blog. And I also think that people that... Um, that know about sustainability topics are going to find you irrespective of whether you have sustainability on your label, on your packaging or not. That's true, that's true. Um, yeah, so this is uh, something that I uh, absolutely see. Uh, I pointed it out at the beginning in context of the direct consu to consumer uh, potential that all the, the new brands have, especially because uh, some of the dairy products they have a longer best before date, they are easier in, in the whole delivery uh, uh, topic, uh, etc. So this is something that where you can create, uh, I would say, a parallel universe. 
Um, this is something that, uh, that, that's really uh, important to, to manage. Um, a question to you, Peter, because uh, now we have heard that the, the one of the most important assets of all the uh, of all the uh, different topics. Uh, wait, a, wait a second. We, we otherwise our screen is getting off. Oh, you just have to move this. I think. Or just make it. Okay. <laughs> a little trouble here. <laughs> no. Um, the, the the thing is um, that um, how do you evaluate um, the asset light solutions that we see nowadays all most of the food startup uh, that that we mentioned are uh, asset light uh, companies so um, can you maybe give an indication of how you uh, evaluate them in the whole process having in mind that uh, the community and the brand is uh, one of the most important values Yes, like of course like beyond the brand and like the, the differentiating product itself like it mustn't be like really like a proprietary ip behind it like no one has done it before it's also very much about like communicating what you're doing like appealing to the consumer like trying from a packaging perspective from like a core value proposition like to differentiate on the shelf like i mean we're talking about many many things uh, here like um what the right IP is, but in the end, like the consumer doesn't have the time on the shelf to digest what your IP is. It's like three seconds of time to convince those 99% consumers that haven't heard of you before they saw you the first time on the shelf. So you must have an outstanding message and like the category must be interesting and big enough, but also like from, from, from a, like a sales perspective, it's not about like how much the sales do you actually make, but like, how much do you know about your sales? Like, do you know your velocities? Do you know like how like trade spend affects your business about like driving your your, your top line? Um, do you know like how to expand? Like, do the founders have like a sound idea of how to like um, approach the entire retail? Like, from which retailer, from natural channel, how to scale to conventional channel? When is the right point in time? When is the, like the right point in time to launch a new product? When do you start like to internationalize when do you how do you like handle the co-packer relations and um, how like um, savvy are you with this and like what is basically the potential like to go to a new co-packer if your asset light like is there like i like an, um, um, enough co-packers in the space to work with like your like ip beyond the, the, like ip meaning more for, for a trademark perspective like how trademark um protectable is what you're doing your packaging your claim your your um your brand overall like those are like important things when evaluating these businesses and also like very much like um the, the team like how are like founders approaching building their team um what's like do they like have it like a sales sales first like a sales driven perspective or do they have like, I don't know, like a pro product guy in their team who is like strong in um developing products having a great idea how to build a product are they like good in handling the financials like do they like go beyond um, like um, cash collection all these kind of things are like important kpis to know that we have like visionary operators we are like it's like these things that we are like checking especially like in asset light businesses we are like investing in so the capability of the people to actually run a business not only to have like an idea but also the thing going behind behind it okay thank you very much peter this leads me really to to one of the last questions um to all the product uh, companies here in, 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 in our panels, can you each name th the three key success factors facing the consumer for an, uh, a brand in the alternative dairy sector? So what must uh, an alternative dairy company nowadays do to be successful and to get access to the consumer and to place its USB? So maybe you have three indications what is for you the most important. Feel free to jump in. Uh, all right, I, I'll take that one. And I'm not going to say anything new or fresher, but I think the people at GFI, they summed it up perfectly. It's price, taste, and convenience. And you need to outperform or at least perform on all those three dimensions. But I think the biggest barrier is, um, it's difficult to pick one, that you have to perform on all three. And I think as, sm as smaller brands, um, we don't have the scale, 
Um, we don't have the same clout that a Unilever or an Oatly might, so that impedes our, or that can, uh, makes um, getting distribution difficult. I think where we do do well is because of our focus on authentic ingredients, clean label, natural, is on the taste. But for me, taste in food is an order qualifier. It, it's not an order winner. You need that to play the game, right? Um, but yeah, I think those three things are my, my point of view. Price, taste, and convenience. Thank you very much. It's same here, but that, that's why, like, we are partnering with Pink Albatross because, like, it's, it's the same perspective we're having. Like, okay. These are like, the most most important ones. Okay. Chris, Steve. Yeah. So, uh, f ad like, adding up to this, uh, I could also just say taste, taste, taste. Uh, but this is a little bit boring. For I would like also really add the the level of uh, communications. Uh, this could be packaging in our case, like uh, promoting this a bit. We designed the packaging that uh, uh, we as a new challenger brand uh, are probably not known by most of the retail consumers. So when they are entering the store with uh, and having in mind, I want to go, I want to uh, cut down my dairy consumption or sugar, or I want to just uh, have like uh, products with natural uh, clean label uh, clean labels uh, we want to give them a chance to to spot from two meters from the shelf uh, that we are like giving this to them that we are that they come uh, uh, like to entering this level of communications the consumer is asking every product in the shelf are you fulfilling this criteria and that we are shouting this out to the consumers saying yes we do but uh, not only uh, stopping uh, there, but also like uh, explaining on the back of the packaging, we created the mini glossary to, if there's a good ingredient, like for instance, locust bean gum to replace uh, egg in a mousse, we, uh, and there's a consumer, like an average consumer, for instance, saying, okay, I don't know this ingredient. And uh, uh, due to law, they have to put stabilizer in front of this, and this is not cool. So this is why we decided to explain this kind of uh, ingredients, like that it's uh, what, from what kind of tree it comes from, uh, and uh, yeah, and finishing up with communications. It's uh, yeah, the whole communication around the brand, uh, the, uh, the brand. It's uh, uh, talking to about your supply chain. Uh, but to be honest, uh, we can't, cannot do all of this right from the beginning, and we have to bring this uh, in step by step. But uh, communication in this sense uh, slash attention, I would say. Right? Absolutely. Get, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I would. Max, yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, I would also um, say that, that the communication in terms of um, packaging touch points um, is, is super, super important because if you're not recognized in the shelf um, at, the, at the retailing space, um, the, the customer won't uh, see you. So he or she cannot uh, decide whether he, she, he or she wants to buy you um, in the end. Um, and then the, the next step will be, will be price um, for us at the, at the retail chain. And yeah, then, then for sure, um, taste taste has to follow. And if this is not, um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know, um, good enough um, to, to make the customer happy, he or she won't buy you anymore. So um, I think these are the three main dimensions. And maybe to add to the communication, what, what Christian just said, um, I think it's not only the packaging at the shelf, but um, also the, the other touch point that you mentioned. Um, so the customer um, has to somehow already, yeah, has the feeling to know you already from, from somewhere so that, that he or she um, is kind of secure in picking your package, um, which you can reach in terms of um, yeah, social media communication or, or even as like Oldly did it, brought um, out of home campaigns um, that probably everyone, at least in the big cities, has seen. Um, which in which they pointed out that they are different and that they are better. And I think these are the two um, dimensions that the customer has to has to understand. Yeah. Trust uh, also has a value. If I know uh, something already or if it's combined with a trusted brand, then it's, it's helping me. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Steve? Yeah, uh, for sure. The first thing is uh, it's taste. Uh, that's something that you that you learn uh, from the consumers anyway. 
it's not about uh, IP only, it's also about taste, um, good branding and a point of differentiation uh, because there's so much uh, competition already. And uh, as uh, I'm sure everyone will be agreeing with me, resiliency and ag agile, because have, uh, working a startup, it's a real roller coaster. We always, we're all smiling at this moment, but I'm sure we're not smiling every day at every moment. So yeah, you need just to be able to take it and, and fight back. So, so besides resilience, uh, um, I would also add con uh, continuity because this is something that I uh, um, um, experience, especially in the B2B sector. If a, a product, and I've, uh, uh, two weeks ago I tasted number 94 of a burger patty, yeah, so, <laughs> and I can guarantee you guys if I'm coming every week with a different recipe to one of, uh, uh, to a restaurant owner or into the hospitality sector, they, they also, uh, uh, so the, the, the product itself must be almost finalized before it hits the market. And this is something that I, at the moment, unfortunately see that in some sectors, there's really a rat race. And uh, especially when we are looking at the cultivated meat sector, so that uh, I'm quite uh, anxious uh, or nervous that the first product, which will hit the market, uh, not meeting the customer uh, uh, yeah, um, how do I say, the customer needs and the, the customer feeling, and this will damage the whole sector a bit. But yeah, this is just something that I wanted to add. So continuity, resilience, you mentioned it, and uh, this is also something that's uh, absolutely important. So great, I think. Yeah, this brings us to an end, actually. We're running out of time. This was also, I think, from Steve's side, good closing remarks. It's about resilience, it's about continuity it's about hanging in there but not being too fast because this can also damage the reputation of a whole category or of a, of a, of a new product of something we haven't seen yet like we hope it's not going to happen with cultivated products but yes there's a risk so yeah this is the end of our second edition the first one was actually on site here in berlin with about 50 people or so joining us at this moment this is not possible so we're really happy that we could do this in a remote uh, format with um our wonderful guests, Steve uh, from YoFix, uh, Chris from Sweets, and, uh, and Max from Nilk, and Peter from Katja's Green Food, and of course, Luke. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, I'm not sure, or, or uh, there will be also some kind of recap because uh, maybe you have uh, seen it, but we had some also some kind of red line through this uh, dialogue coming from the success factors, how you get your product into the retail business, to how important it is to um, to act in an, in an investor field. And in the end, we see also how the next generation of uh, dairy products will look like. Precision fermentation was one of the topic, ultra processing, and of uh, course, uh, trace minerals. This was uh, something that was uh, also new to me. Um, and in the end, uh, we talked about the uh, ultimate success factors, uh, consumer facing. And this is uh, really something the GFI wants, convenience, taste and price, attention, very important, the communication, resilience, and or as uh, we said in the, in the end, continue. So thank you very much for being uh, with us for one and a half hours. And we see the participant list. There are still a lot of people online. Thanks for being there and stay tuned for the next episode or edition of our future food series Albert, yes. it was wonderful with you. thank you it was it was it was really fun and insightful and yes we're going to continue this about dairy and also about other future food thank you thank you guys see you soon stay tuned bye bye, bye.